In LA this week, I'm Saida Pagan at Grand Park. The 2020 census is right around the corner and LA County and city officials are coming together to make sure that everyone is counted this time around. I'll have the story coming right up. More homeless housing popping up in East Hollywood with a promise of more to come throughout the city of Los Angeles. I'm Gil Reyes with a story next. I'm Anna Marcos. Find out how one local group helps retrain survivors of sex trafficking so they never go back. And this pizza shop is part of it. We'll tell you more coming up. Hey everyone, I'm Yana Kay. Here's what's happening in LA this week. Is the marijuana you may be smoking or eating safe? Well, the Department of Cannabis Regulation launches a new website to show which retailers in your area are playing by the rules. Gil Reyes stops by one of them. We pay a visit to Cornerstone Collective here in Eagle Rock, one of around 185 legally licensed cannabis retailers in the city of Los Angeles to see how business is going. Yes, here we have uh, at the more, uh, you know, heavier side of the spectrum, we have the different cushions and, and cookies and gelatos and things like that. Cornerstone Research Collective is one of the rare places in LA City where people 21 and over can buy all kinds of cannabis legally. For years, it operated solely as a medical marijuana facility. But since passage of Proposition 64, now sells marijuana for recreational use as well, stressing its therapeutic benefits. There's a lot of depression, a lot of insomnia, and, and cannabis is, is amazing for these things. There's a lot of refractory diseases that pharmaceuticals have no answer for, including different forms of epilepsy, um, you know, and heart conditions, and cannabis is there. Places like ours are suffering. You have websites like Weed Maps that are promoting all of these illegal places um, on a daily basis, and it becomes really difficult for us um, to compete on that level as well. Co-founders Carlos De La Torre and Erica Crumple say they've had to raise their prices 27% since becoming licensed commercial retailers last year. This helps make up for new state and city fees for licensed retailers. Businesses playing by the rules also have to pay for lab tests to ensure their products are safe. Customers pay more here, but the owners say it is worth it. Everyone that comes to these facilities knows that they are gonna be consuming a product that isn't riddled with pesticides or molds. Not so at unlicensed facilities. A recent NBC4 investigative report found more than 90% of samples from several unlicensed retailers tested positive for pesticides. The city is fighting back. Part of what we've done at the Department of Cannabis Regulation is to try and make it relatively simple for members of the general public to identify who is a lawful facility. So we have a website at cannabis.lacity.org where we provide a list and map of all of our locally authorized facilities in the city. Around 180 businesses and counting. Type in your address to find the one nearest you. Kat Packer, executive director of LA City's Department of Cannabis Regulation, says her agency is adding more personnel to speed up the licensing process for new retailers while maintaining safety first. We want to make sure that folks actually know what's on their product. So there are uh, labels and standards that are put in place to make sure that folks know what the potency is for these products. And this is really first time information that cannabis consumers are being able to have to empower them to make responsible decisions. The department acknowledges a slow permitting process for prospective retailers looking to enter the market because of staff shortages, but plans are underway to add more staff soon. The city of LA recently launched a human trafficking awareness campaign, and for good reason. LA is one of the top California cities for both sex and human trafficking. The group Two Wings is helping save victims by giving them a new life through training, jobs, and education. Anna Marcos gets to know one survivor and her success story. I was 14 years old when I first sold my body for sex. Taisha Harvey has come a long way. 
After 16 years as a sex traffic victim, she finally broke free at age 30. Her motivation, two newborn little humans. I think my kids were really the turning point once I got pregnant and to have two human beings growing inside of me, like, and I know they're like dependent upon me and everything that I do, they're gonna be watching. Four years later, Taisha now works at a local pizza shop, Delicious Pizza on Adams Boulevard. Here she works as an administrative assistant and she also does party and events planning. But there's more. She juggles work with taking care of her twins and going to school at Santa Monica College. She's a straight A student, by the way. I wanna help people who come from traumatic experiences and families that have dealt with generational trauma. I come from a family where the trauma has been generational. It's not just a girl standing on a corner. There's underlying pain behind that person. I mean, there's a lot of abuse, mental, physical, sexual. Here's what Taisha's boss thinks of her. I needed an assistant. She came in and inside of 10 minutes, I knew she was the smartest person I'd ever talked to. And I said, look, I'll give you six months and I will teach you everything I know, and then we'll get you a job that does have a career ladder. I've told her everything. She has went from just being an employer to a mentor and a confidant for me. I've cried on her shoulders many times. Taisha also has another mentor, Elena Shanayan, and her group, Two Wings, have helped her and other sex trafficking survivors make new lives for themselves. This isn't something that's happening in another country. This is happening in your own community. There's a lot of manipulation and a lot of brainwashing that happens with these traffickers to really tell them that no one is there to help you. I'm the only protector. I couldn't imagine the future. Before Two Wings, I didn't really have a clear direction. I learned amazing coping skills. It's about life skills. Two Wings training covers everything from job interview skills to cooking healthy meals for your family to self-defense. In other words, a crash course in Life 101. The program has a huge success rate. Eighty percent of the women who graduate go on to higher education or jobs like Taisha. And out of those women, 90% of them keep their jobs and never go back. I am Taisha Harvey. I am a former sex trafficking victim, but that's not the definition of who I am. And even bigger plans than the pizza shop await. Taisha will transfer to UCLA next year, where she hopes to complete a doctorate in social work. And this summer, she is up for an internship in Washington, D.C. If I get this, yeah. <laughs> The Taisha going to come out right now. If I get this DC thing, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm so excited right now. Like the butterflies is going like, <laughs> I'm going to jump for joy, praise God. Her internship picks Bernie Sanders and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, or AOC for short. This woman is going to be the new AOC in Washington someday. Absolutely, I completely believe that. She is a wonderful spokesperson. She has presence, she has confidence, she's good looking, and she doesn't take crap from anyone. We get the feeling Taisha may not be needing help much longer. Here are some signs of sex trafficking to watch for. A young girl who appears to be under 18 and is trading sex for money, she may seem fearful, out of place, or disheveled. She may be accompanied by an intimidating adult. She may show signs of physical abuse or torture. If you see any warning signs, contact law enforcement or call the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 888-3737-888. City leaders agree, we can't build homeless housing fast enough, but we are making progress. Gil Reyes reports from one new facility in East Hollywood. Don't make me cry. You cry. You're so happy, aren't you? I am, but I'm a good happy, okay? It's a good happy. Rosa Duran can barely hold back the tears. After three years living on the streets, she's now a resident of the new Path Metro Vias in East Hollywood. That's a permanent supportive housing complex for the formerly homeless. This is the power of the people that care and believe. 
and have a heart and a soul. Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, other local leaders, and United Healthcare opened the David T.C. Ho Family Building. It has 65 units on the PATH campus, nearly all of them reserved for the formerly homeless. There's also counseling, case management, and veteran services on site. And that's all in just phase one. Phase two of construction taking place right behind me will bring a total of 187 permanent supportive and affordable housing units once completed next year. There'll be apartments on the top, on the bottom there'll be services offered so the tenants can come downstairs and actually get services they need like mental health or free clinic. Phase two will be among the very first projects built by Proposition HHH. That's a bond measure LA City voters approved to build more homeless housing. Once that opens next year, you're gonna see all sorts of cascading openings across the city of HHH housing. The chair of the city's Homelessness and Poverty Committee and council member Mitch O'Farrell says HHH housing takes time to build. The measure passed in 2016. He says soon we'll see HHH funded projects opening. At, at a certain point over the next three, four years, we're going to have ribbon cuttings like every week because so many of these are going to come online at the same time. And that means we'll be housing thousands of people that did not have a roof over their head. Proposition HHH sets out to build 10,000 new units of permanent supportive housing over the next 10 years. Over at City Hall, Councilwoman Nuri Martinez welcomed California's first partner, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, the wife of Governor Gavin Newsom, for an in-depth conversation on issues facing women and girls and how to empower them to be civically engaged and leaders in their communities. Please help me welcome California's first partner, Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Open up the newspaper, turn on the TV, you see how divisive we become. And some would say, oh, it's just the current administration. Well, no, I like to remind us that the president that we elected is a reflection of our cultural values. Right. Our reality show, lowest common denominator, cultural values. We have to look at our complicity in creating this culture um, that has become so horrifically um, xenophobic, bigoted, sexist, misogynistic, racist, and we can put a stop to it. I want to challenge all of you to utilize your brains and your strategic thinking and maybe even your rebelliousness into creating a new culture a culture that is more inclusive, that is more loving, um, and defy all of those brands and manufacturers and tech companies and entertainment companies that are talking down to you as if you're not smart enough to not be consumed by or addicted to their product. Take power back into your hands. It was an eye-opener for me and I realized how much we need to fix our society and but I also realized how far we can come because of our youth. You know, whatever it is, caring for an elderly family member, I think at the end of the day we're all kind of like in this place in history maybe where we're recognizing what it is to ultimately deconstruct all these gender roles and ultimately be human. I often say, you can't be what you can't see, and so we try to grab those girls and expose them to these careers, and I think having you here is amazing. I enjoyed the conversation a lot because it included a topic about feminism and women empowerment, and I feel like we need a lot more of that. Nearly 200 high school students attended the event. Do you want federal money flowing into your neighborhood for much needed services? Of course, we all do. A big part of that depends on how many people get counted during the census. Los Angeles leaders already gearing up for the count in 2020. The kickoff began with a rally in Graham Park in downtown Los Angeles. Saida Pagan has the story. 
What will we have? Our fair share. Let him hear you in the southeast. What will we have? Our fair share. Let's get it. It's called the Everyone Counts Movement, and this Census 2020 Call to Action Day was just the start of a year-long effort to ensure that all L.A. residents will be counted. Every single time you get one more person to fill out a census form, that's worth $2,000. And that's all we're asking for, is to get our fair share back. Not money that's Washington's, money we produce with our labor and our hard work that we send to Washington and that we demand in a democracy comes back to us. That's why we are here. I count. I count. I count. I count. I count. The stakes are high. Hundreds of millions in federal dollars are given to counties based on census data. In the past, LA lost more than $650 million because the population was undercounted. That means less food on the table for families, CalFresh programs, Head Start programs, health services, it means our infrastructure dollars don't come back home. Besides money, Los Angeles stands to lose congressional seats and political power if there is an undercount in 2020. Los Angeles County has well over 10 million people, and government officials say that alone makes it one of the hardest areas to count for census purposes. The focus now is on those who have traditionally chosen not to participate in the census the homeless, low-income residents, and the immigrant population. Our commitment is to go to the streets to save uh, to our members, to our family, to our neighbors, that we need to make sure that we count, that we participate in this process that is coming in April 2020. Los Angeles officials say they are leading the way in California by teaming up now with scores of community-based organizations, unions, and other government agencies. They say with greater support, they are confident that this time around, they will be able to raise awareness well before the final census count. Some good news. The state of California has promised a $9.4 million grant to support public outreach in L.A. County. Well, he became famous for his portraits of musicians on album covers during the 1980s. And now the work of photographer Glenn Wexler is on display to take you back to a time of big hair and excess. I'm Glenn Wexler. I'm a photographer and we're here at Mr. Music Head Gallery in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard across from the Guitar Center. Uh, this is my show called the 80s Portrait Sessions and it's an exhibition of photography which is kind of a time capsule of the, um, the excess of the 80s and, and the celebrities that kind of wore the excess and it's supporting my new book project which is the 80s Portrait Sessions. It's really just kind of a cross-section of, of the people that I shot during, during that time period. It ranges from um, early in the decade with musicians like Shaka Khan, uh, Bob Weir from The Grateful Dead, who's on the cover of the book. I shot him in the early 80s, Michael Jackson from the mid-80s, and just kind of a range of other artists. The 80s uh, was just a very unique moment in time. Uh, the economy was good. And it was a period of marketing excess. I started shooting album cover art when I was a student at Art Center College of Design. And the first project I shot was a album by the Brothers Johnson, who were produced by Quincy Jones Productions. That kind of opened the doors to the musical kingdom for me. It was like saying Open Sesame, and I got inside to like this very kind of exclusive world. And once I got in, I kind of never looked back. I began shooting a lot of album covers. I shot literally hundreds before I turned 30 and during that time period I was commissioned mostly to do these very kind of elaborate narrative works but it also gave me access to the musicians. I always wanted to kind of back away from the more complex type of epic album cover approach and do just and do something just kind of you know up close personal intimate and just really connect with the artist. There's really great stories behind every, every, um, every session and every artist. Um, one of the things that I have in my book is I did small little anecdotes, um, just kind of memories about the session and what we were doing. For me, the exhibit was really a unique opportunity um, to go back to my archives. It was um, 
a chance to look at some files that I hadn't seen, some as, as old as 35 to 40 years. So it was really kind of a, a trip going down memory lane. What was interesting for me is now we live in this digital world of photography, but it was my analog experience, spending years and years in the darkroom as, as a master darkroom printer, that informed all my decisions in, in, in creating the, the images for the show. So even though the work is kind of quote unquote digitally remastered, it's the analog world of, it's the traditional photography that informed the digital decisions for this work. So I, I got kind of the best of both worlds. One man has turned riding the bus into a non-stop quest for social justice reform. Gil Reyes reports from El Pueblo in downtown. More than 12 years and over 120,000 miles of bus trips has led to a BBC documentary, various other projects, also this exhibit in downtown Los Angeles that chronicles the plight of people struggling to get by. So the exhibit we have right now is called Greyhound Diaries, and we worked with journalist Doug Levitt, who is a former foreign correspondent, so a journalist, uh, who spent about 12 years on and off riding the Greyhound bus. He, uh, while he was riding, he would listen to people, listen to their stories. Some of these tales of troubled travelers are documented in downtown LA's Museum of Social Justice. The museum's Jennifer Gutierrez gives us a tour. Vintage photographs. Photos of, of Doug's travels over the past 12 over years. Past 12 years um, different, you know, in different uh, Greyhound stations. So it's really stories about people living on the edge because that's who rides the Greyhound bus. The Greyhound is the cheapest way to travel if you want to travel long distances. Levitt reported his stories using his own music. This led to a BBC documentary and book shining a light on income inequality in America. It's told through the loss of loved ones, the plight of undocumented immigrants, and the struggles of ex-felons readjusting to society. Here it's so much more personal right. to see right. their faces. And to personalize it, and then also I think then people can identify with it. Because not only do they can put a face and uh, a story to an issue, but then also it might resonate with something that they've experienced or somebody they know who's had a similar experience as well. And I think that it really is the key to making change. Get on board Greyhound Diaries. That's at LA's Museum of Social Justice at 115 Paseo de la Plaza at El Pueblo in downtown. The exhibit is free. The Greyhound Diaries exhibit runs through May 26th. A new community basketball court is unveiled. Council District 9 connects residents to employers looking to hire, and a group of women are honored for their hard work. All this in City Beat. Students in Watts celebrated the opening of the new Clippers Community Courts at the shared campus of the U High School and Charles Drew Middle School. Councilman Joe Buscaino welcomed rapper and community activist Styx, whose impassioned support for the project was the driving force behind it becoming a reality. I'm going after organizations and sports teams that represent and that back places from where I come from and the faces that look like me that support those faces. Empower LA held their 2019 awards banquet at City Hall. The annual awards recognize LA neighborhood councils who have been leaders in civic engagement and responsiveness to their community's needs. Council District 9 recently partnered with AAA for a job fair in South LA. AAA has many positions available and is especially interested in hiring local applicants. A lot of our people are coming back and wanting to um, stay within their neighborhoods and work and we have a plethora of jobs to be able to supply. He was a labor leader and civil rights activist who dedicated his life standing up for farm workers' rights. Cesar Chavez fought for equal treatment, pay, and decent working conditions. His contributions were celebrated with some food and fun during a day of remembrance. Let us bless this day, bless this community. Amen. And we're just happy to be here with you celebrating the life of Cesar Chavez. Today we are at the Great Lock High School in South Los Angeles celebrating Cesar Chavez Day. It's a great 
opportunity for the community to come together and really celebrate our values of the dignity of labor, uh, the dignity of community, uh, and the dignity of citizenship. Having an amazing time honoring the memory of Cesar Chavez. There is so much we can learn from him and from the life that he lived. He was a champion for labor, a champion for immigrants, a champion for equity. On um, issues of fairness and issues of equity, things that we still struggle to achieve in this country. And we are a great place, a great city, but we still have a lot of work to do. Now that he is no longer with us, it is our job to continue his legacy and the work that he did. We appreciate you for bearing the spirit of Cesar Chavez. Congratulations, sir. It really means a lot to the community here. There's not a lot of events that happen here, so we're very thankful for that. There's a lot of vendors, there's a lot of uh, community members. The food is great, the music is great. You know, all the tables that you go to, there's resources. I did not wake up this morning thinking that I would be at a wonderful event such as this one. Come enjoy family, come enjoy fun, but most of all, uh, come celebrate the tradition of activism. Wishing everybody a wonderful Cesar Chavez Day and si se puede. Enjoy a lineup of features and shorts from Indian filmmakers. Check out a new exhibit highlighting the Harlem Renaissance and find your next great read at the Festival of Books. All this and things to do. You're invited to attend the 17th annual Indian Film Festival of Los Angeles. Enjoy a prestigious lineup of narrative and documentary features, shorts and star-studded gala events. It's all happening at the Indian Film Festival of Los Angeles, April 11th through the 14th. The festival will take place at Regal LA Live at 1000 West Olympic Boulevard. For more details, visit IndianFilmFestival.org. Discover the works of Harlem Renaissance photographer Kwame Brothwaite in a new exhibit entitled Black is Beautiful. This photo exhibit will include iconic images that amplified one of the most influential cultural movements of the 1960s. Black is Beautiful, the photography of Kwame Brothwaite opens April 11th and runs through August of 2019. The exhibit will be held at Skirball Cultural Center located at 2701 North Sepulveda Boulevard. For more info, visit skirball.org. It's the country's largest celebration of its kind. The Los Angeles Times Festival of Books returns to write another chapter in the hearts of SoCal book lovers. Explore authors old and new with over 400 booths and tables, book signings, readings, and more. So grab your required reading wish list and head on down to the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books, happening April 13th and 14th, beginning at 10 a.m. The festival will be held at the USC University Park campus at 1335 Truesdale Parkway. For details, visit events.latimes.com slash festival of books. And that's a look at some things to do. That's it for this edition. I'm Yana Kay. From all of us here at LA This Week, thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. See you next time for more of LA This Week.